Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Cybersecurity series by Seven Rules Cyber with me, Chirag Joshi. Now, on the show, we've tried to bring in a lot of different viewpoints covering so many topical areas and and areas around cybersecurity that don't get as talked about as, as they should be. And, and one of those areas for me always has been cybersecurity for small businesses and not-for-profits. And generally speaking, their technology uh, infrastructure and how they manage and run technology as well. Now, small businesses, uh, has to be said, are lifeblood of our economies. Uh, without them, I don't think things would move at all. And uh, we rely so much on these businesses for our day-to-day -day functions. It, they are a big part of our supply chains as well. So for larger organizations, the importance of cyber resilience uh, of these organ these smaller organizations is very critical. So it's it's all an interconnected uh, world that we live in, and no industry vertical or you know the size of an industry is completely immune from the rest. So I think that's where it's really important that we pay attention to this topic. Now, if you think about cybersecurity advice and a lot of recommendations that come forward from most reputed areas they still largely are related to larger organizations or medium-sized organizations. Sometimes they're not as practical for small businesses, and which is where I wanted to focus on that aspect today. And to join uh, this conversation and have this discussion with me, I'm so delighted that it's the right person. It's uh, Brett Randall. Brett has been a CIO uh, for uh, Hillsong Church for over 20 years. And now Brett is uh, doing his own consulting business. Uh, but I know he has a wealth of insights to share, and he does a lot of work with, with small businesses and, and not-for-profits, So, which is why we're to have him on. Uh, and before I bring Brett formally on, I think there are a couple of statistics that, that are really important for us to recognize. The first one, you know, studies tell us that over half of small businesses go out of business within six months of suffering a devastating cyber incident. And the other one is over 40% of cyber attacks target small to medium businesses. So it just tells you the threat's real, the impact's really, really significant. So it needs the attention. So Brett, with that with that note, uh, welcome to the show formally. I'm so glad that you made the time to do this. I know you have lots of insights and, and a key, key uh, outcome that you want to derive is improving the, the cyber resilience of, of an industry, which is not as talked about as it should be in my view. Wonderful. Thank you, Chirag. It's fantastic to be with you. And I, I should clarify, I was definitely with Hillsong for 20 years uh, in a variety of roles there. And CIO was definitely my most recent role there. Started off there as an engineer a long, long time ago and uh, moved very quickly into management roles, seeing the, the great potential there with uh, with building a team and building technology and all that we could do with it. And uh, so, yeah, for the, for the last 15 years, I've been in, a, in an assortment of technology leadership roles and have just loved it. And now, like you said, I'm consulting uh, primarily within the nonprofit sector uh, and small to medium business a little bit as well, but primarily nonprofit. And just love seeing the great work that these organizations do and the ama amazing people that work in them. And I'm, I'm keen to help them, you know, make the most of the opportunities that are out there, but also uh, to to mitigate the risks that they face in the operating environment that we have today. Oh, definitely. No, I think, and it's uh, there's so so much there for us to talk about, right, Brett? So let's just dive right into it. Uh, with with that uh, in mind, is the the first thing I want to talk about is as a, as a CIO that that the role that you held, and now you are essentially uh, as you know consulting CIO playing playing similar roles. Is what do you think are the unique opportunities and constraints of being that senior technology executive in small businesses? And not for profits. Yeah, look, it's uh, there are some very unique opportunities and constraints in both of them, and they, and they do vary slightly. Uh, you know, small to medium business generally is defined as an organization under about a hundred staff, under fifty million dollars. Typically, in these organizations, you're not going to find a CIO. They're, they're too small for that level of leadership, but but they need that level. You know, they they need that governance. They need that cyber resilience. They need to be finding opportunities to use technology to their advantage. And so there's so many opportunities in the small to medium business uh, sector for them to use technology more wisely and more effectively. Uh, nonprofits as well, uh, very widely. Uh, across Australia, there's over 600,000 nonprofits, which wow. is a figure that blows your mind. Only 12,000 are registered as companies and, and you know, report to ACNC. Um, so it's, it's still a, a decent number. And if you look at the size of these nonprofits, you've got uh, over 2,000 of these nonprofits have in excess of $10 million revenue a year. So wow. 
we're, we're dealing with some decent sized organizations in there. 20 of them have revenue in excess of a billion dollars a year, which when you think about nonprofits, you don't think about that. These are huge organizations. Uh, and so the, obviously these larger organizations will have those CIOs and those, those very formal hierarchical technology structures in place. But, you know, if we focus on the smaller organizations, the, uh, the nonprofits and the small to medium businesses that are under, you know, that 50 million a year, maybe 100 staff, then like I said, you're really going to find CIOs there. Uh, and so increasingly, these organizations are looking to people like yourself and me and, and their MSPs and looking at ways that they can more strategically use technology and, and find ways to you know, engage with their stakeholders and their customers and their constituents uh, you know, much more effectively uh, and, I guess, uh, much more exponentially than they have been able to historically. Yeah, and, and that's... So many, so many cool statistics there, right? I mean, the the extent and the reach of what we call small businesses is so vast, and also the within the small businesses, there are so many variations to it in both size and scope. So, I guess, I guess my question there, Brad, is when you and I just want to talk about it because in my in my approach, in my books, and the seven rule cyber framework that wa- that I champion is I always talk about everything starts with understanding your business, right? Like what are the critical assets that you have, uh, the most you know important uh, information that you that you hold, that your customers trust you with. Once you have a good sense of what what you have and what's most critical, then you can start having a meaningful conversation around around security technology. in In your experience working with uh, you know executives uh, of these businesses, what has worked for you? Like, what what really is effective in terms of engaging these executives? Uh, because I don't believe that technology and cyber resilience is all the time at the top of their mind. Because they have so many different hats that they wear. Uh, that while they understand the importance of it, is not something that takes up all of their time, and neither should it. Right? That's why people like you and I exist. But how have you engaged effectively with them, and what has worked for you, and what has not worked for you? I guess. Like, where do you think that? Was what a bit of a challenge, and you had to pivot and adapt. Yeah, look, I mean, I'll start with what hasn't worked for me, and what I've seen not work for others as well. At least it doesn't work long term. Coming in uh, to an executive team or to a board, and and, and uh, you know, telling them what good cybersecurity is or what good technology is, and just expecting them to jump on board. You know, that we've all seen that doesn't work. Scaremongering, so using fear, using uh, exaggeration, and and unlikely statistics to try and get things over the line. I mean, most of us that have been in this industry for any period of time will have seen this work once or twice in an organization, and then that's it. You know, executives cotton onto the fact that you don't know what you're talking about, or that you're just taking them for a ride, and then uh, and then you know you don't get to do that again. And so, what, what I have seen work, and what I've found to be very effective, is and first of all, obviously, understanding the business that you're in. You know, yeah. you and I are not in the business of technology; we're in yeah. the business of helping organizations to to be cyber resilient, to be effective and, and more strategic in what they do. And so um, there's so many different avenues we can talk about here. I guess when it comes to cyber resiliency, every executive wants their business to be successful and to be around tomorrow. And not having cyber resiliency in place, they're seeing it in the news every day now. It means that organizations are losing their reputation, they're losing income, they are facing financial penalties, and we're starting now to see the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner yeah. uh, start to uh, address that and start to possibly be bringing some penalties against organizations for, uh, for poor cybersecurity practices. And obviously, the biggest one is the loss of trust, yes. particularly particularly in the nonprofit sector. And I've seen this across a number of nonprofits. When you lose trust, it is very hard to get it back. Mm. It can be a multi-year process, if you even can. Uh, and I mean, the good news is the nonprofits that I see that take this seriously do, do build that trust back up. They bring those donors back. They bring those consumers of their services back and they do um, they do find themselves getting back on their feet. But how much better would it be if they didn't have to do that in the first place? You know, if they if they put those solid foundations in place so that they weren't uh, impacted in some major way. Nonprofits also tend to store a lot of sensitive information on often quite vulnerable people. Uh, so uh, it's it's quite a, a poor reflection on them when they don't protect that data sufficiently uh, and when it gets out. Uh, I'm sure you've seen Australian Clinical Labs recently yeah. 
uh, being uh, raked over the coals a little bit um, for you know some some alleged uh, lapses in their cybersecurity posture because of the the nature of the information that they're storing, firstly, and the uh, the mechanisms that were allegedly not put in place uh, to protect that. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. They're obviously a, a big for profit, but the, in the non for profit sector, definitely um, those that are facing cyber breaches are going to are going to see that trust disappear. The problem, I guess, and it comes back to the constraints that we were talking about before, is that budgets in, in both small business and non for profit are finite. Uh, you know, um, every dollar that they have that comes in, they want that to be effective in in yes. outworking uh, their mission, whether that's building products for customers, uh, if they're a small to medium business, whether that's delivering services uh, to their consumers uh, as a as a nonprofit, they want that to be delivering real value. And every dollar that you divert to something like an insurance policy or a cybersecurity initiative or some some best uh, best practice technology uh, foundation, there's another dollar not going towards these other initiatives. Mm. Mm. And so that is a constant uh, challenge uh, for small to medium business and nonprofits for dealing with. And I guess what you and I get to do is come in, understand the business, and then help people to look at what are the, what's the low-hanging fruit that they can really uh, you know, bite into today, the things that will deliver great value at a low cost um, and that are going to have the greatest impact on their stakeholders. Uh, you know, that's that's one of my favorite things to do is to come into organizations and, and just help them to find that, you know, meet with their key stakeholders understand what it is that they are really excited and passionate about and what is it that they think is going to deliver the, the best value and then help them to protect that, help them to optimize that. Uh, and so if if we keep going to those executives um, that are looking for greater returns on their investment, we really need to start at that, at that base level of understanding what the business is and aligning what we're trying to deliver with what the business is asking for. Yeah, no, well said. And I think that's that's... And I truly believe, I think that's important for all cyber and technology leaders and professionals to keep in mind. You know, we're talking about small businesses here, but even in larger organizations, you know, the money spent on cybersecurity could be spent on on something else, a product, a service, you know, trying to outreach or for garments, you know, providing service to the citizens. And which is why it's so important that we stay away from these one size fits all, the sensationalism, the fear to your point, and actually make things real, uh, real to to people. And I, and I find, in my experience, the best way to do that is talk in a language that the business understands, which is finances and risks. They all understand that. They all take risks every day in their business. They all understand the financial aspect of it when you can break it down sensibly, uh, but also providing you know sensible solutions, right? Like. Uh, certain solutions and uh, products or approaches are fit for purpose for you know the larger organizations the ASX 50 or ASX 100 uh, but may not work as well for small businesses might be an overkill and in some cases just might not work uh, and might hinder them so i think that's really key but along those lines something that you you mentioned caught my attention there was uh, you know the the executives in these businesses are also aware that they they need to do something they need the, the cyber resilience thing is not this unknown thing out there they understand is important in australia well about half of our population's data disclosed in one shape or form with the last three or four breaches we've had so it's, it's a massive mm -hmm. you know staggering number everybody's across cybersecurity is important but a culture i think a culture is really the key when you start to see these things seep into an organization is you don't view this as a role of one individual or one consultant or one managed provider, you view it as a role that you and everyone in the organization plays in security. And how, so my question to you is, when it comes to security culture, moving beyond awareness and training, right? I mean, that's important, but that's not the only thing about culture as we know. How have you gone about, you know, addressing the culture bit to get the right technology and security outcomes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, that's a yeah, fantastic question. And Look, for the majority of my career, I've had some amazing uh, mentors and managers, um, and they have drilled into me from the beginning how critical it is to have culture right yes. uh, to, to enable effective change management to occur. Um, uh, the last sub I just finished a psychology degree. The last subject of that degree was culture and psychology. And so this one is like top of mind for me at the moment. 
but you know, 70 years ago, I was reading this recently, 70 years ago, um, some anthropologists came together and they came up with 164 definitions of culture. And that was 70 years ago, right? So 2023 now, I think I saw another paper recently. It's it's grown since then. Culture is complex. Um, we talk about culture so easily and so simply, but it's actually a very complex topic. Mm. If we, you know, if we distill this down to its basics, culture is a system of rules that are established by groups of people to ensure they can survive. You know, that applies back when you look at the beginning of time, it applies today in our organizations. Culture is what enables us to survive, I guess, to thrive as well uh, as a people. So take that now to an organization. Okay, Culture is the rules, the norms, the values, the, the shared constraints that work together to encourage that survival and that thriving. So if we're thinking now back to your question about outcomes. So we've got, um, do you get any outcome? You're going to go through a, a season of change. There's going to be things that have to uh, adapt. So if you're implementing new technology solutions, new cybersecurity controls, you're going to go through change. People are going to have to uh, adapt the way they work. And so think for, think for a second about Cotter's, you know, eight steps of leading change. Any, any management textbook you read through when it talks to change management, we'll talk about Cotter's eight steps. Uh, and, you know, all of his eight steps revolve around one thing. It's, it's the people. Um, he doesn't, you know, there's, there's the eight steps, and I'll read through them in a second. I've written them down here because I was going to get the order wrong, and that's embarrassing. But the eight steps, uh, the first one is creating a sense of urgency. I would add that. To all of these, I'm going to add a few words. And to add to that one, I would say it's creating a sense of urgency in the people. You know, you're, you're helping people to understand there's a need for change. His second one is to build a, build a kind of guiding coalition of people. Uh, third one is to form a strategic vision with people. Fourth one is to enlist a, enlist a volunteer army of people. Mm. And they're the people that are going to be, you know, making the change a reality. Fifth one is to enable action by removing barriers between people. The sixth one is to generate short-term wins with the people. Seventh one is to sustain acceleration of people. And the eighth one is obviously to institute that change across the people or across the organization. And so those eight steps, if we think about all of those eight steps, the rules, the norms, the constraints of culture, they, they have a massive impact across each of those steps. And so to get effective outcomes from any technology or security change initiative or any investment requires all of those eight steps to be successful every single time that we make a significant change. So if we look at culture, if we look at change, if, if we look at our organizations, we have to continually remind ourselves as technology leaders that you know our main job isn't actually getting the right technology in place. At, at the end of the day, our jobs as leaders are about helping people help people. You know, whether those people are our employees, whether that's our citizens, if we're a government, um, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, if it, we're talking private sector, public sector, nonprofit across the board, as technology leaders, our job is to help people to help people. And so, I mean, back to your question, I, I know I've taken a very circuitous route to get here, but culture is so intertwined uh, with, with every element of what we do as technology leaders that we, we need to be spending more of our time as leaders, understanding it, educating ourselves in it, experimenting with it, uh, envisioning ideal future states, you know, making incremental adjustments to the culture of an organization or a team until we get there. And, and so we understand what initiatives are going to be success, su successful, which ones aren't, um, and you know what kind of changes we're going to need to get those outcomes to take place. As we get better at understanding culture and, and how it impacts successful change management, uh, I think we'll be able to take those learnings and those skills from workplace to workplace, and, and they'll be universally applicable. So probably a whole lot more philosophical than what you were hoping for and asking apologies, but I, I think no, if we're going to understand... Yeah. It's an important, it's an important, and I'm really glad that you went down this road because I think it's important that we 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 think about culture to your point in a more you know deliberate manner. Because when we're talking about security, culture is an example, is to me it's a to your point, right? That the shared the shared values, the the beliefs, the norms, it's what what are the like is is a company's culture, a security focused culture. And I think that starts with, it has to be an organizational culture that allows the security culture to flourish, where people are free to bring up risks as they as they feel, where somebody makes a mistake, they're willing to open up, they see something, they report it, they don't just wait and sit on it. I think all these things are good behaviors, but also good behaviors are when you are in midst of a, a, a tough challenge, you don't bypass security in the name of, uh, you know, just sheer efficiency, unless you're making an informed choice of accepting a risk. And if that's the risk you take, willing to take on, and it's within your appetite, fair enough, right? 
Uh, but the ones where you where you just bypass it for the sake of convenience and you put that, I think that's that's hard because to your point, uh, the digital, you know, we talk about digital trust, but it's really trust that we have. When we when we go to, uh, you know, uh, a, a local health clinic or we use a financial advisor or we, you know, take advantage of a, a small business that is offering us accounting services, all of these places, we are trusting these professionals and we're trusting them with a lot of sensitive information that, that we have. And we, we expect them to hold that with due care. In this day and time, we we know things will be breached and incidents do happen. But what really hurts us is when we see that there were no efforts made to secure our data, and where there was nothing made in terms of having any any response plan or prudent communications. And I think that's where it becomes hard, and that's where culturally, to me, is is a big point: is the type of third parties and vendors you use. Uh, are you cutting? Are you are you cutting corners? when it comes to basic hygiene, and we'll get to basic hygiene because I think that's important. Uh, but, you know, have you just kind of made security and IT thing where you're expecting an IT person or IT provider to look at it for you and you're too busy to take a look at that despite this being a business you run and people who you serve are your own customers. And for small businesses, sometimes these people know them personally, unlike mm -hmm. some larger ones, right? Where you can become a number sometimes. Uh, so with that, uh, I think the culture bit to me is always resonated and awareness of training is one part of it, but there is a lot more. The, the question I do have, and I talked about hygiene and you talked about low hanging fruits early on. So what are the, you know, the five or seven things, Brett, that you would suggest and based on your experiences, advising small businesses that, hey, if you do these five to seven things, you are largely going to be okay. Mm -hmm. This is not about a solution or a product. This is about these seven, eight things you do and you're largely okay. Do you have a, a few of the, them that you think will resonate with most of our small businesses? Yeah, look, the Australian government's done a pretty decent job, uh, well, the ASD, I should say, with the essential eight. I think yeah. that's a, a great starting place. It has gaps um, and it can be uh, overwhelmingly uh, technical for business mm. leaders to look at that and, and understand what exactly it's telling them to do, you know, trying to try and explain vulnerability management to a to a CEO of a, of a nonprofit, it's it's quite a complex topic to try and explain to them all all the various elements of it. But the but that said, the ASD Essential Eight with the right MSP or the right uh, you know consultant in place can uh, can really mitigate. No one puts numbers, but I would say you know eighty percent of the most common risks that organizations are going to face, the ASD Essential Eight uh, will will help solve things like MFA backups, patch management, all, all those basics that everyone should be doing. Um, I, I I love that it makes it so approachable, I guess, for anyone that has a, you know, an, an idea about technology. Um, so that would, I guess, be the first one. You know, obviously there's things like um, aligning with uh, information security management system standards like ISO 27001. That is obviously, you know, up there in terms of the amount of work required and initially upfront and ongoing. I would love to see organizations do that because I think that is where you demonstrate, speaking about culture, that's where you demonstrate that it is part of your culture. You know, you've, you've implemented cybersecurity, resilience and governance across the organization and not just once, but you're continually uh, checking and updating that. So I would love to see that become something that's easier for organizations to do, and more common for them to do. But but the, the size organizations that I'm working with, that's that's too heavy a, mm -hmm. uh, a burden to carry. And so in, you know, in lieu of that, I think it's really important that governance itself is made a priority. So what are our policies and our procedures? Are we doing cybersecurity awareness training? Are we monitoring that? Um, are people aware of the risks of uh, the activities that they're conducting from their, you know, from their phones, from their computers? The, the training is essential. Mm. Um, but I think people need to understand not just cybersecurity training and, uh, you know, what a phishing attack is and, and, and or phishing or, or any of these things. They need to understand the part that they play in the business's future by the risks that they potentially expose a business to through things like shadow IT, through things like uh, not protecting their phones properly, through not watching who's over their shoulder in an airport. All these important things we learn about in cybersecurity awareness training, we need to now be able to demonstrate to the staff in these businesses and the volunteers the, the risks the organization faces if those aren't done properly. And so these are things that, um, you know, the ASD essentially doesn't talk about. So I kind of add on as things that I think are really important that that businesses really need to, to start working through. Yeah. And, and well said, I think uh, in my view, ASD 
uh, essential aid uh, is, is, is a good starting position. So I, I do feel the level of maturity that you want to get to because essential aid has multiple levels of maturity comes down to what you're comfortable with uh, for your mm-hmm. business. Some some controls are harder uh, for small businesses uh, within essential aid as well than, than others are. Uh, but I'm with you. I think things like patching, backups, uh, MFA, uh, I think those are those are so essential and and awareness and training. I wish you know that that came about there because why we say it's not about aware, all about awareness and training uh, for small businesses. I think sometimes they need to be trained on specific things because we know business email compromise is a big challenge for these for these businesses. Uh, you know, you have the fake invoices issue, the gift cards, all of those those traditional scams are still quite rampant and create a lot of havoc for them. And mm-hmm. and we know that you know. Studies tell us that ninety percent of cyber breaches start with a phishing email. So phishing mm. is still a problem. And now you add on the, you know, the additional tools that attackers have at their disposal with artificial intelligence, makes the role of human critical thinking even more even more important. So when I published guidance uh, for you know small and medium businesses, I talked to them about well, firstly understand your your business and your assets because you know. People might store data in multiple places without even realizing. You know, it's on people's devices, on uh, you know USB drives or, or physical drives. It could be in the cloud. Have a sense of where it is, like you know, because that's where the problem starts when you don't know when your assets are, uh, and then you get down to these controls that we've been speaking about. Uh, while ISMS and other those more mature, I guess, holistic frameworks might be an overkill, they still have a structure to them, and I think that's where I tell small businesses is. Hiring a full-time CISO might be too expensive uh, or hiring a full-time CEO might be too expensive for certain ones or CIO rather. Uh, but there are there are these services now there in the market and I'm not saying hire you, know, you or me only, but get an expert. Get somebody you can you know, engage with who's an independent voice uh, because you need that. Your IT managed service provider might be trying to do the best they can, but you need that independent that voice who's holding them to account because that's where the struggle start is these basic controls need to be applied in a specific context and the type of third parties you work with the incident response plans that you have they won't be as many playbooks as the larger ones do nor them you i don't think you need them uh but you do need a sense of what are you going to do when something bad happens what exactly yeah, is the one two or three steps that you have and for for that i think you need that you need these insights so Brett, the next area I want to move to is, and I mentioned very briefly about artificial intelligence being leveraged by the bad actors, a lot of good things out of it as well. But I also think it is a big opportunity for small businesses who are using technology smartly. It's not doing AI for the sake of AI, but rather solving a business problem. Uh, and, and where have you seen that small businesses are getting smarter about leveraging the benefits offered via improvements in generative AI and in AI holistically? Yeah, look, AI, definitely I am seeing people using it to streamline their existing day-to-day work that they do. It's not, in my world at least, I'm not seeing it being used in anything crazy innovative. And and honestly, I don't think most nonprofits and SMBs in that, you know, less than 50 million a year should be investing heavily in developing their own uh, artificial intelligence. I was reading an interesting uh, post on LinkedIn today. Somebody was saying that they were part of a startup about a year ago working on a whole bunch of stuff. And then ChatGPT 4 came along and blew them out of the water. And, and there was no point in them even investing the money that they had at the end of the day. And so I think small to medium businesses and nonprofits, there's so much great AI out there. And, and you know, as a consultant, there's probably three or four different AI packages that I use regularly to do different parts of my job, to speed things up, to achieve more than I can do by myself. And that's where I'm seeing um, small to medium businesses and nonprofits uh, really start to embrace AI. I think... Uh, Chat GPT, look, people look at it as an emerging technology. I um, if you don't mind, I found a uh, book on my bookshelf recently. This one here, it's called Living with Computers. Mm. I was given this, or I awarded this about 30 years ago. And uh, I thought that I found an interesting paragraph in it that I was reading recently. So it's reading time with Brett on Chirag's podcast. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read there we go. We have paragraph. one more segment now. <laughs> exactly. There you go. This paragraph, I laughed when I read it. Um, it's, remember, this is written about 1990, and it says, artificial intelligence is considered to be of such importance that it is one of the fastest growing high-tech areas. Again, this is 30 years ago. <laughs> Many companies are spending large amounts of money to either develop AI systems or purchase systems developed by other companies, <clears throat> Microsoft. Um, 
With a natural language AI system, it would no longer be necessary for users to learn special computer languages in order to give the computer instructions. Using an AI system, a manager could access a database simply by typing in his or her questions in plain English. And, you know, this is 30 years ago. People are talking about the stuff that we are now seeing in 2023. Yeah. Um, so it was it was emerging then. It's still emerging now. I would say it's ma it's maturing. It's got a long way to go. Um, but but I love AI and I love seeing what people are doing with it. Um, I think the, the real value in emerging technology for small and medium businesses, for nonprofits, is helping them to do more with less. I mean, nonprofits particularly are uh, having trouble uh, finding and retaining good technical mm. talent. Yeah. And so, and, and not just technical talent, talent across the board. Uh, nonprofits you know, typically do pay their staff less than, than corporates do. And so you find people that are very passionate about what they do, which is fantastic to have in an organization, but it can be hard to, to retain them for you know, yeah. any length of time. So I think AI helps you to, or it, it is helping them to be able to have somebody that's not skilled in a certain area. Maybe they're not skilled in copywriting, not skilled in uh, you know, image creation to start to do those things as part of their job. Um, and and to be able to reduce the amount of people that they need. And I guess the same would be said for small to medium businesses as well. You know, a lot of startups don't have the the resource they need to be able to do everything. And so uh so the AI is really allowing them to expand faster than they than they would before. Yeah. I, mean, I think uh I think one more thing on that is you know, Copilot is coming in Microsoft soon, um, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I think when that uh, allows nonprofits and small biz small businesses to integrate their data from all the different data sources within one platform together, query it, generate insights from it. That's going to level the playing field. I mean, sadly, at the moment, the way Microsoft have released it, only customers with EAs are getting access to it. So instead of leveling the playing field, we've like polarized it at the moment. So the the people with money are getting these amazing tools to make them more successful, and everyone else is kind of stuck with Chat GPT down here. But you know, over time, I know that's going to balance, and I'm look, really looking forward to uh, helping nonprofits to to really gain some interesting insights from that. Yeah, I look there are lots of opportunity there, and, and that's where you know, and that's what I mean, right? Is being smart about investments for small not for profits is, you know, AI. I'm complete, and 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 thanks for that that story from 30 years ago because it's so true. We've been talking about this stuff. We've been talking about stuff for many years to your point and and now we are at a point where we're starting to see some of these things come to fruition uh although i do find sometimes people mix automation with ai and you know ml machine learning has been around for a long time well there are different aspects of ai but if you put that that angle aside and just think of the benefits offered i think the the automating of tasks that are manual that are you know repeatable you largely understand them so many opportunities there uh, I think there are lots of things, and you're you're right. I don't think they need to go out and build their own language models for the most part. I think it's more about using what is out there smartly and for the right outcomes. And I think that's where the value comes in is high, is engaging with good people, is just finding out well what is my objective. Do I want to make more sales? Do I want to become more efficient? Do I want to reach more people? Do I want to increase my time to serve, or, or or rather decrease my time to serve and increase my reach? Whatever it is, I think you need to have those metrics and then AI can serve as a mechanism to help you get there, depending on what you are able to do. But Copilot is going to be going to be really cool. And I think there are lots of promising things that I'm I'm seeing out of it already, which is which is quite, quite good. So let's let's hope for the best on that front. Uh, the, the, the last topic which I want to tackle, Brett, and I think this is a very I've kept the biggest for the last, I guess, uh, is engaging with managed service IT managed service providers and getting the best investment value out of them. Now don't get me wrong. I think a lot of IT MSPs want to do best by their customers. But we've also seen that and I, and this is my view is we've started to see every MSP suddenly become a security MSP as well. Uh, everybody wants to do cybersecurity, everybody thinks they can do cybersecurity. And somewhere I feel and and let me know what your thoughts are. I feel sometimes Small to medium businesses can can have that view of oh well, my managed provider takes care of it. They're taking care of my systems. They take care of the patching. You know, they take care of uh, running it. And if something were to happen, I'll just call them. That that may be okay, but then how are you as an executive getting assurance that your investments are spent wisely and that the limited amount of money that you have for this, you're getting the right secure outcomes, and who's keeping your MSPs honest? 
And I think that's an area which I really wanted to have a discussion with because I feel that sometimes there's an over-reliance on them without truly understanding that cybersecurity risks, you can't you can't outsource them. They're still your risk to own and you can have mm. people to help you, but it's still your risk and there is no getting around it. Mm, yeah. Look, we could spend hours just on this one topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so again, you know, I, I like to to wax lyrical and go a bit philosophical. So let's let's think about our MSPs here for SMBs and NFPs. Our, our MSPs are providing a service. They're providing a function. In, in many ways, it's no different than an IT department providing a function. You know, it's just it's the same function. It's just that we're outsourcing it. Yeah. So so for for a minute here, let's think about MSPs not as some other organization out there. Let's just think of them as our technology team managing our services. They're, a, they're an IT capability. They might be internal, they might be external, but but they're providing an IT capability. So what, what you know, like you said, what we've got to think about what is it they're delivering? Are they delivering, you know, day-to-day functions? Are they trying to deliver a security uplifts? There's so many different areas that MSPs work in. To make sure that um, SMBs are getting the best value from uh, their technology team, whether it's an MSP, whether it's FTEs, whether it's virtual CIOs and CISOs, um, whatever it is, executives need to be engaged with the MSP and mm. be, have an open dialogue with them and making sure that the needs and the desired outcomes of the business are known to that provider. Again, whether it's an MSP or an internal technology team, they, they need to know what the business requires. The, the technology team, again, whether it's an MSP or internal, need to have a seat at that table with the executives where they're hearing where the business is going and able to provide input back to the business on opportunities and and risks that uh, that might be coming up that technology can help with. Look, whenever I sit down with a, a new you know a new client or a prospective client, I'm always asking them how do they get on with the current technology provider or the current technology team? And I, and typically I always find it's one of two extremes, right? It's it's either they're great, they take care of everything. I don't have to worry about patch management. I don't have to worry about anything. It's all taken care of. Or it's the opposite. It's horrible. Costs a fortune. I don't know what I'm getting. You know, why am I paying this money to this company or to this team to do this job? Um, now, that's not to blame the team or the MSP. They're not necessarily at fault here. They may be doing everything that's expected of them, but the problem might have been a you know, breakdown in communication, whether it's not clear to them what value they're meant to be delivering to that organization. So the SMBs and NFPs to get maximum value out of their, so I don't know if what, for, yeah, SMBs and NFPs to get maximum value out of their MSPs. There's too many acronyms happening here. Um, they need to be, um, they need to keep open those lines of communication. They need to be, you know, asking for proactive, mm-hmm. continual improvement from that team, from that MSP. In in the same way that, as you know, as a manager, I would be asking my team to continue developing, continue learning, continue delivering a new value to me as the as the manager of their team, I would be expecting my MSP or my technology team to be delivering that value to me as an executive. So, you know, if we flip this around a little bit, the leaders, the executives in, in small to medium businesses need to not just pay those bills that come in. They need to not just pay the, the MSP bills or, you know, the, the virtual CIO or the virtual CISO bills or the technology team, you know, salary bills, all that. They need to not just pay them and expect that they're going to get a return on that. They need to be making sure that the people that are in their organization are the right cultural fit. We talked about culture a bit before. Is the MSP the right cultural fit for them? You know, if if they're not, then go find another one. There's there's hundreds of MSPs out there and, and there's great MSPs out there. And if they're not the right cultural fit, if they're not fitting in, if they're not delivering the value, there's other MSPs that are. But before even going down that stage, it's important to make sure that business leaders are clear with those that are providing services to them, what they want, what they expect, and and to make sure that you know those, those teams that are providing those services understand what's what's expected of them. And if they can't deliver it, they should be open and, and honest about that. No, I like it. And 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 if if I had to ask you, Brett, what are the two or three questions I guess you would recommend executive ask their MSPs to? understand if they're getting the right outcomes. I mean, because sometimes I think you're right. It's, it's communication breakdown. Is you're not asking the right question. You haven't set clarity of outcomes and that's why you are not, you're getting frustrated, but it's nobody's fault because you're not clear on what you want. They just took what you gave them as, as on face value. Uh, yeah. So what are the two or three questions you would recommend that uh, executives should ask 
their MSPs on an ongoing basis to make sure that they're getting the value? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess, you know, initially, I would, it's it's not just questioning. It's a two-way dialogue that has yeah. to happen. But I would, I would be saying, look, these are the outcomes that I want to achieve. And, and yeah. it's different for every business out there. Um, but, you know, if the, if the outcome that you want to achieve is a level of cyber resilience, I would be asking them, okay, what what have you delivered historically that would meet what we need today? Like, do you have the experience to do that? Mm. And, and secondly, do you have the skills to do that? Do you have people that are actually trained in whatever it is that you're that you're uh, going to be delivering to me? So if you're delivering a managed, uh, sorry, an, an, an MSSP service, managed security service to me, do you have people on your staff, in your team, you know, people that you contract in that have those required uh, certifications and have been doing this for a period of time? Or are you just, you know, there's a new a new trend at the moment, so we're going to get a few security products under our belt and then and then sell them to you and, and mm. pretend that we're providing a security service. Sadly, there has been a bit of that. I don't think it's, I don't think it's you know, the majority by any means, but it, you know, we have seen a little bit of that. Um, and so that's definitely making sure that there's not just a good cultural fit we talked about before, but a good strategic skills fit for the organization it would probably be one of the critical questions I'd be asking an MSP. No, very, very good point. And I think that's that's essential. You know what I also feel, Brett, is, again, we've talked about SMBs being just, it's, it's not just one size, right? There, there are multiple things here. But I do believe that if your question is around getting, you know, secure outcomes, and that's what you're concerned about, I almost feel like looking at that in the aspect of a, a report that is around risk is really key. Because then you get a handle of you know where your maturity is going, right? Like, and that's where we talked about ISMS earlier and control libraries, and some of them might be overwhelming, but sometimes you can actually have short, sharp libraries, which are key control objectives that you have for the threats. Because I've always uh, always said cybersecurity is uh, you know is sometimes made much harder than it is. It actually is hard, but it's not that complex. It's actually quite straightforward if you do it right. I mean, it doesn't mean it's easy. But it's sometimes you make it too much, too much more than what it needs to be, and and often you know the threats that you think about are either from an external adversary who's looking to compromise the systems to steal data or hold you to you know ransom or take our systems offline. Could be an insider who you know steals data, commits fraud. Could be an insider who makes mistakes. You know sends your customer records to the wrong email address, or your third party fails. Right, and that's usually these things that go wrong. And for them, if you define you know the key controls, and you get some someone to help you with that. Where you define the key controls, not technologies. I'm not. I'm not even talking about privileged access management solutions or web application firewalls or EDRs here. I'm talking about control objectives. Is you know, uh, is my data safe at at uh, rest? Is you know, are my applications safe from uh, internet facing attacks? If I think you start with those objectives and then you take that to your MSPs and have that conversation, all right, these are my objectives. How are you meeting them? And where are the gaps? I think that informs a really good conversation where you can have this ongoing partnership, but you also have now key things that you keep an eye on every every quarter or every month or reporting cycle that helps you understand the health of your services. So I think there are ways you can do it, which is more pragmatic than boiling the ocean. So you take the best out. And this is where I see is, you know, for SMBs is, is join your association, be part of, you know, these these kind of conversations that we are having where that idea comes to you, engage with an expert, bring them on for some time, keep them on a retainer basis if you can, because then that allows you to have this. Because if you don't do that, uh, you create this gap and you create this communication challenge and, and which may be okay until something bad happens. Uh, or even if nothing bad were to happen, it's just suboptimal investments, which you could be doing better. So anyway, those, th- those are my thoughts on, on that topic. But you brought up a really good point on how you engage. is It's a dialogue. It's not a question you ask them. So if you go with them with an open mind, you are open to listening to their feedback as well. Because, hey, these guys, if they're good ones, they might have threat intelligence or they might be subscribing to other feeds that can help you. And you can be curious and ask them, hey, what threats are you seeing uh, that affects mm-hmm. industries like mine? Right, like, don't talk to me about a nation state targeting, you know, this ASX ten company. Talk to me about small medium businesses. What are you seeing? And I think those type of open questions allow for better discussions. Yeah, definitely. MSPs have that economy of scale and that uh, capacity where they are working with so many clients and so many uh, providers 
that they have insights that you know the, the typical organization won't be able to get access to and so there's so much potential there but i think something you've touched on a few times throughout this call is that independent person that that knows what they need to know to be able to help the organization deliver on those critical outcomes i think uh, you don't know what you don't know obviously and so for businesses that don't have anyone internal that understands technology I think having having an MSP is obviously great to provide the day-to-day -day services, but having somebody independent to come alongside them to peer review any uh, proposals that come through and just offer that strategic guidance uh, is such a great way for sm these smaller organizations to, get, to really get that expertise in place and to be able to um, to, to know that they, they're getting uh, what they need to be able to stay resilient in what's a crazy world today. 100%. You know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, I think it just is these things you don't have to make dramatic shifts right it's just a small tweaks to your direction and that can help mm -hmm. you get there faster and better and yep. uh, again I, I never tell people that go out and hire people or hire services i tell them understand the need for it how you fulfill that need is up to you mm -hmm. uh, but acknowledge that sometimes you need that and if you bring on somebody you know, as a permanent person or assign somebody in an organization that responsibility fair enough as long as as long as you know what has to be done uh, because I, I think this problem cannot be ignored. And one aspect which I think is really important is more and more larger organizations, because they have so many regulatory challenges now and imposed upon them, which are, which are fair in many cases, is you know around supply chain security. They need to work with reputed providers. They need to ensure that people who supply services to them are secure. So I think it's just smart business for these small businesses to actually have the right, you know, uh, right credibility that they can actually demonstrate to their customers. Uh, who can you know give them lots of businesses guys this sets us apart is we actually know what we're doing and we have we have the right controls and having been la sizo and kind of you know wearing that hat of the executive roles is you see the you see that being a challenge is sometimes you're dealing with organizations that just don't know what good security is and then you are almost reluctant to recommend them you point out risks and the business typically will take your advice on those risks so just some insights there is if you it's just good for your business to not just for you know holding your customer trust which you should do anyway. Uh, Brad, you've been very generous with your time, so I really appreciate it. Look, I just want to have a last last question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, in your journey, Brett, like uh, obviously having at these roles and now a consulting role, uh, what advice would you give to someone who is now starting to work with small and medium businesses for the first time maybe in their careers who they haven't dealt with them before uh, and have only dealt with larger businesses. What advice would you give to people like them on how they should approach small and medium businesses? Mm, yeah. Look, small to medium businesses and NFPs are definitely highly relational. I mean, all organizations are highly relational, but particularly when you're at that smaller, less than 100 staff point, everyone knows everyone. And mm -hmm. often the way things get done is through relationship. And so that's that's important to understand in terms of getting things done. It's also important to understand in terms of, um, you know, understanding the risk that might be evident there through things getting done without proper process. Mm -hmm. And so uh, realizing that relational uh, capacity, I guess, within organizations is critical. Also, obviously, this applies anyway, not to small business, but learning to speak the language of business um, mm -hmm. and not not talk technical. I think you and I have probably seen too many times over the years people come in uh, to, you know, IT leadership roles for the first time and try and talk technical to executives, and it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere. No. You confuse people and and you lose people, and so you know, especially in small to medium businesses where people don't have that technology expertise, you need to be able to learn how the business speaks, learn their culture, and and speak at that level, not not at the level that uh, you and I might speak at if we're having a beer somewhere. Really good advice, really good advice. The relational aspect of it, the simple language aspect of it, and then understanding the pros and cons of a classic process not always being documented uh, mm -hmm. and, and understanding and acknowledging that. Brett, uh, massive thanks to you. I know the audience will benefit greatly from the insights you shared, so I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll obviously include uh, you know, uh, a link to your uh, contact details in the show notes as well as the LinkedIn if you're comfortable for people to reach out to you. Uh, I know you're doing a lot of great work and, and you you serve a very important part of our of our economy. So I massive thanks to you again. Thank you so much, Shrag. It's been fantastic talking with you. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity.
No, likewise. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to our audience. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, as always, uh, if you like what we do, uh, please subscribe. It, it helps uh, us get more content and get more great speakers like Rhett. So thanks for that. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.